I'm Coffee Kevin, and I was just doing my warm-up exercises. Well, I exercise a little bit now and then, and today I'm going to give you the secret to making a great mocha java blend. What the heck is mocha java? Does anybody know anymore? It used to be a very common term in the coffee business. For one thing, every roaster in, in any supermarket worth its salt how does salt fit into this? Is uh, oh, that's a whole other story. Um, is um, had a mocha java, and mocha java. See, there is water here. I knew there was. I just saw it. Anyway, the uh, uh, it was a bottle of water. It doesn't matter. Uh, we, uh, uh, but mocha java. What does mocha java mean? Uh, you hear it even. Uh, I was watching a, a an old film on American Movie Classics, a W.C. Fields film, and he starts talking about mocha java, you know, and, and uh, what is mocha java? Well, mocha java at one time was a uh, very, very popular blend. The, again, the, the original blend. And it's named after two coffees, mocha. And mocha is a, is a word so overused in the coffee business it isn't uh well maybe it is funny because mocha can mean everything to chocolate flavor uh mocha can mean the uh port of mocha is where coffee was originally shipped from which is why a lot of coffees are labeled were and were labeled mocha that probably were not uh from yemen uh and the, and the port of mocha but uh, or near there, they were, they were, yeah, they were from near there, they were near there so they could be shipped. So, and Java. Java is, how's Java fit into this? Java is a slang term for coffee. You know, get me some Java. Java's, of course, become uh, known in the computer biz. Uh, and but Java is originally stands for Indonesia and uh, Java coffees. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Java is probably uh, used in a lot of uh, mocha Java blends, but it's not the only thing used. In fact, neither mocha nor, nor Java are necessarily components of anyone's mocha Java blend. You really need to research this stuff. You can't trust anyone in the coffee business. Uh, it's probably the wisest thing I've ever said. Uh, well, you, you certainly you can. It's just you, you can't know who you can trust. That's that's the that's the real challenge. Uh, there are plenty of uh, good and nice people in the coffee business. I as I'm thinking of, wow, unlike 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 D friend, yeah, but uh, there 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 really are. But you have to uh, labeling has always been a challenge in anything we ingest. Well, probably anything, period, but anything, certainly anything we ingest. You always want to be uh, cautious about it. Um, for one thing, at the minimum, you want to get what you pay for. And uh, But Mocha Java is one of the first um, efforts the coffee business made to cheapen a product. And I don't necessarily mean uh, make it worse, because in some ways it curiously made it better. So I'm going to teach you how to do a mocha java coffee. Why would, I, why would you even want to learn one? Well, for one thing, it's great history. For another thing, it actually can be a really, really tasting killer cup of coffee. Some mocha javas I've had, uh, and in fact, um, n many but not all, were trying to follow the original formula. Um, are just wonderful because the idea was you took a uh, a mocha. This is a Yemen mocha, uh, and this one is from Hansa Coffee Roasters in Libertyville. I actually reached out to see if Kevin Kane would come on today, but uh, he's unavailable. And Tom Meglin um, is uh, kind of their resident geek. There, he is unavailable. He's taken a vacation, which is. Um, I think he's up near where I was last week. Anyway, um, look at this coffee. Can we get a, a actually, can we, uh, what if I lay it on here, Michael? Can you get a good shot of it? Is that a good way to do it? Yeah, look at that. 
Look at that coffee. Now it's uh, got that little uh, uh, David Hamilton model filter on there. But uh, if anyone knows who that is, they, I'll be surprised. Uh, but look at that. You can still see some of the skin on there. Yeah, if you could just focus up a little bit. There we go. There we go. Now, is it better with this lens or better with this? Okay, uh, there we go. There, uh, and look at that coffee. It is irregular. It looks like, is it, some of it's been roasted. Some of it looks like it's still yet to be. It's very uneven. Well, I can tell you, regardless of what it looks like, you know, it's one coffee when you roast it, Part of the goal is not to correct, you know, uh, there are occasionally roasters and home roasters beware of this too. Um, people try to make the coffee look a certain way as if that means, I know, admittedly, it's, a, it's certainly uh, one of the signs that it's done, but you don't want the coffee, uh, you don't want to correct the flaws in this. Uh, if you do, you'll roast it too much. You will over roast it. And by the way, curiously, I think that's true for Sumatra as well. Uh, anyway, this is the mocha part. And they're, they're little beans. They're irregular sized. And generally speaking, um, they're all over the lot. Sometimes they're not real uh, big bodied. Uh, generally speaking, I don't think of them as a big bodied coffee. Uh, but they can have a whininess to them. Uh, they can certainly be full of complexity and acidity, uh, meaning acidity is another word maybe for complexity, but on the bright end uh, of complexity. But man, they are just fabulous in the cup sometimes. They are, they are and when you taste a good, a really good mocha, as rare as they are, they are, uh, you say to yourself sometimes, I, this is it. I mean, I've found absolute heaven in coffee. And so, I'm always on the lookout for a good Yemen. And when I saw this, I spotted this the other day at Hansa. I was like, yeah, yeah, load me up. And this is all they had. They had a very small amount. They put it in this unmarked bag and they said, you know, just go. <laughs> uh, I, I think they've got a little more now, uh, but this is a, uh, a really nice coffee. Okay, now I'm going to show you the other coffee we're going to use, and to do that I'm going to have to pull it out of the bag. Uh, I got this up in uh, Milwaukee at Colectivo. Colectivo for years was known as Altera. They sold the name Altera to Mars, I believe, and now they, uh, now they have, uh, I'm going to weigh this because we're going to make a blend. Come on. Uh, almost. Close enough. Sumatra is a Java, is, hmm. Sumatra is not a Java coffee. Sumatra, Java and Sumatra are two different regions, but in, a, in an 1871 book written by Thurber, E.A. Thurber, um, about the coffee business, this, this predates, if, you, if those are, if you are coffee geeks uh, watching this, this predates the uh, a Euchre's book. Uh, and I used it, I uh, nicked a few things from it for my book. I did in my history, um, you know, we all... As Beethoven would say, well, I was influenced. <laughs> I, I was influenced by uh, by Thurber's book to the point that I I sort of lifted some things directly from at least some thoughts. And one of them was about his claim that the highest end Javas at the time, at that time, were from Sumatra. So that tells me something. That tells me ah, I see they were all just throw you know the, part of the coffee biz. They just at that time in history the Sumatra coffees were just labeled Javas. The, the idea, I, I get it, I get it. It's brand confusion in the marketplace. We don't want to teach them the Sumatra word. We just, everyone knows Java. So in the highest end uh, mocha Javas, they used a Sumatra. So I follow that, why not? I can afford to. Uh, 
when there's great Sumatras like this. Plus, also, I haven't seen a lot of Javas around lately. There definitely uh, is a, f a taste difference between Java and Sumatra. Uh, and, and there are several uh, Sumatras. There's not just one ubiquitous taste called Sumatra and one Java. What's similar about them uh, generally is uh, they're both on the heavier bodied side, Sumatras being a little larger bodied in my opinion. Overall, this is a generalization. The other thing is there's a little more acidity usually in a Java than a Sumatra. Uh, however, they are perfect blend. They're big beans as opposed to small beans. And again, the risk with the Sumatra particularly is People try to take this big bean, it was really kind of hard to roast because of uh, the moisture content of it and its size. Uh, just think of it getting a, a, a steak evenly done. Uh, it's very hard to do that, and what happens is they tend to get over-roasted while they're trying to fix all the little uh, nuanced differences. So I would say, generally, you are better off sl slightly under-roasting a Sumatra too, so that you don't um, fix whatever problems it l appears to have. Now, I would also say, I'm going to set this down here, Michael, so if you want to get a really good shot of it, uh, you can. There we go. Uh, and you can see, I will say one thing for uh, Collectivo, they did not try to fix all those things. So I believe, and I know the uh, Fowlers who own uh, Collectivo, and they are very, uh, they're very savvy uh, bean buyers and very good roasters, and they get the big picture of this process. Uh, I uh, think a lot of them. And uh, this is a, uh, uh, they, are, they are one of my favorite uh, roasters um, when it comes to Sumatras. So we are going to take these, um, this uh, Yemen, and we are going to uh, combine it with this. Now, I've already done it. And why have I done it? Because I wanted to make sure we had it um, ground and everything. And I, anyway, so I took 20 grams of Sumatra. There's more Sumatra, more Java, if you will. And Yemen, even though it's mentioned first, well, this gets into, you know, modern uh, world. There might be a legal reason that they would want the, uh, the larger part of it mentioned first. I don't know. Well, let me think about that. Hmm. I wonder how many Kona blends are out there that really have the majority of, of uh, the largest part of the Kona blend is Kona. I don't think any, so maybe nothing's changed. Um, anyway, this is uh, a third Yemen, a third Mocha, and, and two-thirds Java is the classic blend formulation. Now, there's all kinds of Mocha Java blends. I almost guarantee you there is no law uh, that uh, states what a mocha java blend has to be. I'm pretty darn sure of that. And therefore, we've got one here that is, anyway, follows the original recipe. Now, why was, the, let me uh, go uh, a little bit here. Um, why is mocha java, why is this blend so famous, maybe infamous? Well... The story is that um, the Dutch who ran the coffee business in the uh, uh, early days of coffee, um, in, in, when, it, when it really hit Europe, they, it was always run through Holland. And in fact, there's still a lot of the coffee business is cupped. Uh, a lot of coffees are cupped in Holland. Uh, I've attended cuppings in Holland, in uh, Amsterdam. and. So a lot of the, uh, uh, and the Dutch were, of course, uh, did a lot of trading. Well, the Dutch, apparently, uh, the c coffee industry in Holland uh, decided that the Yemen farmers were getting a little um, too demanding in their, uh, in their payments. So uh, they did uh, the next best thing. And this, this uh, is profiled somewhat in... Um, in the uh, video uh, from Indonesia. Anyway, I'll have to remember the uh, term of uh, the uh, name of it. I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll post it on the uh, Facebook uh, page afterwards. Um, but it's a, uh, a fabulous, by the way, uh, 
film. It's uh, in my to my for my money, it's the best uh, film I've seen, including compared to mine about coffee. Um, and uh, it's uh, really has this story in it. And it's uh, what I love about it, and I love it dearly about it, is that it's not written from the big guy's point of view. It's not written by the uh, the uh, European point of view. It's written from uh, and produced from the Indonesian point of view. Anyway, the uh, the Dutch ran the coffee business in the world, but it also actually at that time um, uh, it's co one of its colonies uh, were the Indonesian um, islands and uh, the group, and that uh, allowed the Dutch to set the price in Indonesia for the, uh, le for the, co for the, uh, that's why it's two thirds. This probably has everything to do with why it's two thirds. Now I will say, um, there's enough craft in the coffee business by this time in history that I believe there were taste considerations, but certainly one to three worked out, uh, uh pardon me, one to two worked out very well for, uh, both the coffee trade and the, uh, end user. And in fact, uh, it's really when blending is believed to have been discovered, and one of the wonderful things about it is you get uh, the benefits of the Yemen and the benefits of the uh, Java, uh, or the Sumatra in this case. And that's you get the body of one. I mean, this is all general terms. It's not always the case either, but you get a whininess, for, supposedly, and an acidity, sharper acidity of the Yemen, and you get the uh, balanced with the larger body and um, body uh, and the uh, complexity of the uh, Sumatra, or Java, as it were. Whatever is playing the part of the Java, whatever is playing the part of the Mocha, and there are Mocha Java blends with Ethiopian and. Um, there's Ethio uh, bl blends with uh, that have Colombian in them. There are blends, but generally it's a it's a Mid Eastern a coffee, uh, such as a Yemen or an Ethiopian, uh, with some sort of larger bodied Indonesian coffee is the classic blend. And uh, I was I remember George Hall used to the Coffee Connection used to have. Uh, Yemen, uh, Sanai, uh, Nani Sanani. Uh, I believe George used a Java, not a, not a Sumatran. And um, then he also used a Colombian as a component. I guess just as a, I don't know. <laughs> but he found it uh, worked well for his blend. Keep in mind, George was uh, the taster at the Coffee Connection, but I don't believe he did all the roasting. I think that was mostly Robert Tatala. I don't know if Robert's still in the coffee business, but Robert was, in, by my money, a really good roaster. And uh, together they were a great dynamite team. Let's see. Uh, so let's get this uh, going. Let's uh, put it. It's going to be 30. Uh, I'm just going to double check it. And I've, I've completely mixed the blends, uh, the uh, blends, the beans. Uh, it's close enough. Uh, it's... Uh, 29.97 so we're good enough this is and I uh, always uh, kind of stir a blend in the bean form when I use it it probably doesn't matter in the end because they end up being intermixed well anyway but I just do it out of habit um, I'm going to make it with a Chemex uh, let's see uh, do I really need yeah I think I do I do want to measure uh, I want to weigh it because I'm going to, I used, uh, we're going to call this 30 grams, and I use 30 grams, and then I put, um, I put water, I zero it out, and then I put uh, um, 450 grams of water in it, so, it, so that that's the end uh, temperature, and then I've got it set to 197 on my uh, brewer. So let's see, the Dutch uh, sent, uh, sent this message um, to the farmers in Yemen that, hey, guess what? We don't need all of your coffee. We found a way to make two-thirds of the blend, of this blend, uh, a, uh, uh, taste great and um, 
doesn't need your coffee. So it's a first of the, uh, that I know of historically, of the lessons taught to the farmers. And, uh, you know, it's business. I've certainly been a supplier. Um, in effect, uh, the farmer in uh, the television business. So I know uh, that's what uh, happens. And that's, you know, part of competition. Um, so... Uh, by the way, uh, the story of the smuggle, the, there's always a story associated with smuggling the plant from one country to another, and I've heard one about Yemen. I've heard the same story with different names in it. Uh, it always involves a romance, and it always involves a, uh, a sea captain that uh, seduces the wife of the governor to smuggle the plant out or something like that, and uh, I have no idea whether it's uh, any of these have ever been really checked, but they're always fun stories. Makes you think you can't trust a sea captain, that's for sure. All right, let's see. Uh, looking good here. And, you know, my philosophy is don't overpour the water in the Chemex or any drip method. Probably more important to get your own method eventually and just stick to it. But that's how I do it. I don't, I, especially with the Chemex, I like uh, to not always fill it up to wa water and, you know, do the, limit my pours. I prefer more pours because my thinking is keeps the water hotter. Uh, it also, uh, there we go. I do keep the water um, heated, although I've done it both ways. Frankly, if it, uh, it usually tastes, uh, pretty good even if you if you if you slightly air um, it tastes better than uh, almost any method because of the care you're taking that's kind of loose science isn't it yeah well and there you can hear that I love the sound of water dripping through And we're at 300 grams now, so we've got 150 grams to go. You can hear it giving a little recharge here to bring it up. I don't over, I don't, you know, I know uh, 200 is, you know, what uh, some of you would set the, uh, I, 197 to me is a real nice pour temperature. Never, uh, air is on a softer brew. Not too acidic. Kind of meditative. You know, I was doing these arm exercises at the beginning, and that's because I learned those from Larry McManus. He was a hypnotherapist and a napropath who was, believe it or not, came up with the idea. You know, all of my ideas, not almost none of them are my ideas. I just, I, I swear, I, I, ironically, I'm a good listener. People give me these ideas, and Larry said, I mean, you ought to write about coffee. Because I was boring him to death talking about coffee. Anyway, Larry was, uh, Larry and I did a, uh, a tape called dial a trance where you could call a phone number and you could you get a self-hypnosis uh, trance. We were taken down several times by uh, well-meaning uh, religious people who thought it was somehow demonic. Uh, it was certainly not our intention to be. Uh, but, well, you know, something we did on a Monday. All right, and then um, here we go, 450. 
but uh, I did a lot of fun projects with him. And he was, a, but he was a napropath and a hypnotherapist, and he would uh, teach me these limbering techniques. And anyway, that's why I was doing that. Not it's not it's not a, any kind of there's no meaning in it. 450 grams are in there. I can shut this off. This will continue to re reheat forever. This is the brim kettle, which I really is becoming a, a favorite of mine. Uh, and um, uh, I just got word I'm getting a new kettle from another company in a couple of weeks uh, being sent here from China. And let's see. So this will be, should be a really beautiful coffee. This is a coffee, by the way, you can have cream in it or not cream. You can put sweetener in it. It, it will take it either way. It tastes delicious just by itself. Uh, if you, can, you know, I, I sometimes think coffee is like baker's chocolate. I don't think it's really going to ever be completely successful on its own. I understand, uh, yes, a third wave uh, devotee would say, oh, well, I would never put anything in my coffee. Well, I, you know what, I find that's a real deal killer with a lot of people. So I, I'm not, uh, I'm not that, um, you know, it's like, uh, of being Catholic and having people over and insisting they say the rosary with you. I, I, uh, I don't do that. So, you know, it's, it's up to uh, you if you want to uh, do that. Look at that. Let's get an overhead of this, Michael. I'm very proud of this. Oh, is it going to show up or is it one of those where it's really not? Do I have to tilt it to get the light? Uh, it's, see if you can, yeah, see if you can get in there. And uh, gee, I wish I had a portable light sometimes. Um, you know what? Uh, yeah, this light. This light here, if you can give me that light, I can show it. Oh, that's pretty good, actually. Well, give me the light anyway. If you just push it in, just push it toward me. I can get it. Okay, thank you. And then um, watch this. Uh, just, oh, darn it, there's no battery in it. Never, never mind. Okay. Well, that's actually pretty good. And uh, that shows you the how nice and there we go there's a nice uh shot of it with kind of a little bit of an angle see how even it is there it's all really nice and extracted okay now that that little object lesson is over let me um pull the filter out and oh there's a nice uh nice alternate shot there michael very good okay and then i'm gonna pour I'm actually going to pour mine first because I want it to cool just a bit before I sip it. I we had that uh, coffee the other day and it was too hot for me. This is a Chemex. That's one reason I chose the Chemex. In my opinion, the Chemex is... Um, all right, and there's yours. And let's try this. Mm, but, well, I'll tell you what, very different aroma-wise to the, the uh, Sumatra uh, by itself. And, you know, blends, I keep saying blending is, is a lost art. If we can go to this camera, that'll be better because I'm really talking to people. Blending is a lost art. It is uh, just, you know, it, it, uh, I had some... Uh, I bought a blend of coffee. I think Dunkin' Donuts, for instance, does a good blend. Now, maybe beneath you to drink Dunkin' Donuts, if you're someone who's uh, into third wave, you know, into the very pinnacle cup of excellence coffees, you're going to say, oh, no, no, I, it's, I'm way past that. Well, I, I'm not way past that. I enjoy those. I enjoy uh, the... Uh, the brilliance of... Uh, I can enjoy the brilliance of the Dunkin' Donuts blend the same way that I can enjoy you. Michael's flashing me his Dunkin' Donuts card. Uh, is uh, the, uh, thank you. I don't have one, so I'm holding up his. Uh, but, uh, you know, and they're, they're, they're not good for anything. It's not, I, I don't mean, I, I don't mean the card. I mean, uh, Dunkin' Donuts is not like they're going to reach out and support Coffee Con. But um, it's, uh, I, it's a guilty pleasure of mine. I, I enjoy uh, going around and tasting diner coffees, and I have to say, overall, Dunkin' Donuts, I think, uh, does a pretty good job. Start to finish on the process, uh, including the brewing. The biggest risk with Dunkin' Donuts is the franchisees sometimes uh, uh, back off a little on the old family recipe and uh, it's a stretch, and I wish they wouldn't do that, but I do uh, enjoy their 
their blend and uh, when I brew it myself it's always perfect. Mm. This is a magical moment too for this. Let's see what temperature it is. One, one thirty, one thirty. You know what? One thirty. Great uh, drinking temperature to get the complexity of this. I've got the I've got the Yemen and the and the uh, Sumatran really nicely balanced. Considering they're two different roasters, and I, I I think it's fair to say neither one of them had any idea that someone was going to do this on a a vlog uh, to. Uh, combine uh, their coffees and make a, a, a mocha java blend out of it but they do work really well together they're uh, they're just enough yin and yang you know it's just like uh think of it like wardrobe matching you know you're getting you get a uh, i've got a uh, light gray pants on today and i've got uh some shade of blue shirt and uh, th that was a really classic you know blend uh same thing in coffee so, you know, this is a really nice coffee. And, by the way, it's a really good coffee to try out on someone if you're trying to uh, evangelize them to uh, drink coffee uh, without anything in it because it's got enough sweetness in it. It's got enough uh, complexity in it. It's, a, it's got a... And, and why... What's the problem with two coffees together? Why, why would that be a... A, a challenge for anyone. I don't, uh, I'm lost as to why that would be a problem. Most wines that you buy have something, uh, some other wine in there uh, to uh, add some level of complexity or to balance things out a little bit. I think the uh, coffee business uh, has Play down blends in an effort to go to uh, single origin um, at some expense. And I mean, I have a lot of single origins here. I would say the majority of coffees I drink are single origin, so I'm hardly uh, uh, asking that we reverse. I'm asking for a tolerance of uh, a wider range of uh, coffee tastes. And I think blends offer a lot. And this is a classic blend. So I've for a long time been thinking about doing this. I happened to run into the Sumatra. I happened to run into the Yemen. The timing was there. I saw them on my counter, and thus the idea was born. And I sent Michael an email in the middle of the night. This is what we're doing. So anyway, I'm Coffee Kevin. And uh, just so you know, a uh, little bit of an update. I'm still, obviously, the uh, fundraising is over for uh, that stage of trying the fundraising. And I learned a lot of lessons. Um, uh, including uh, try to get one more ten dollar donation so that we could keep the money, but we can't do that. So uh, now, and uh, most important is we learn the lessons that we want to do in the future. I've just been on the phone um, with uh, a couple of people in the industry who do understand and and probably increase their understanding of our plight through the uh, fundraising. So it had sort of a, a secondary uh, purpose in that regard, and. Uh, both of them are talking about uh, wanting to be involved and wanting to get something up and running uh, for next year. Uh, and I'm also reaching out uh, to see maybe a collaboration on the venue uh, with someone, and that'll be a nice, uh, interesting surprise and experiment, I suppose, as many things in my life are. But I'm really uh, looking forward to that, and uh, obviously it's my passion uh, to do coffee con. So I, I, I'm already sold. So it's just a question of seeing if I can get, um, everyone else, uh, was a Huck, Huck Finn, you know, <laughs> and if I can get everyone else to help me paint the fence, uh, I'm coffee, Kevin. See you soon.